Um, all right. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm C. Owens. This, this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, tonight is part six of our study, our look at, our reading of the Manifestation of Lights Sutra. As you can see, the, the lights continue to grow. Um, we are nearing the end of the first part of this sutra. And I'll have more to say about that at the end of tonight, um, as far as next week and all of that. Um, but basically, I'm going to pick up right where I left off last time. <clears throat> the, the place where I left off, the sutra had introduced the, a new theme. And the theme was about the I. And it was all about these different things regarding, um, well, actually, if I go back a few steps, we had just reached this interesting, what I, what I think is a very funny part of the sutra, where the poem was going back and forth with all of these um, examples of the kinds of people who will like this sutra and the kinds of people that will, won't really like this sutra. And it's a kind of funny back and forth about that idea about that this sutra sort of is a certain type of sutra that may only appeal to a certain type of person in that way. So where we left off regarding the I, it was still within that kind of back and forth regarding the nature of the I. In particular, it was talking about someone who understands the nature of the I versus somebody who's confused about the nature of the I. And actually the sutra has a few different um, things about the nature of the I that it was talking about. And we got into this section last time and we began to talk about it, but I wanted to sort of back up a little bit. And so for the first part of tonight, I've prepared sort of, at least to the degree to which I prepare things, I've prepared a kind of a Dharma talk, if you will, on everybody's favorite subject, on emptiness. It's, what, it's what's going on in the sutra, even though this sutra has been really wild with all of these lights, and it's been this big, long, almost epic poem at this point it has finally kind of gotten to, in a way, some really, some really heavy dharma, some really heavy ideas, some really heavy teachings. And so before I go any further with the sutra, the nature of the I, I wanna, I wanna kind of establish a few, um, just a few ways of thinking about emptiness. And I wanna do this now, so that all of this is very fresh in our minds when we get to the nature of the I. <clears throat> so as I kind of think this might go, so emptiness is always a very tricky topic. It's one of those things that it's sort of so simple, yet so profound, so it's so tricky. And because of that, I'm tonight, I, because I want us to have a really good understanding of emptiness, I'm going to walk us through a series of steps. There are a series of analogies. Everybody knows I love analogies and examples. So I have lined up this series of examples that's going to lead us to the eyeball, to the nature of the eye. And I think it's going to be like three or four steps. So the first, it's the simplest. And it's an example that the Buddha often gives in various sutras. And I think it's a really good starting place because it actually is about the I, interestingly enough. So what the analogy is, the analogy is this. It's about someone who has a a maybe a cataract or a scratch on their cornea 
or even just a um a smudge like a greasy like imagine you've had grease on your fingers and you were to like rub your eye and you got a smudge like a greasy smudge on your eye or a scratch on your cornea or a full-on cataract the buddha uses the example of a cataract but not everybody knows what a cataract is so i just want you to know that we're talking about a defect of the eye right of the, the 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 eyeball and what the buddha talks about is this person who has a defect a blemish a cataract on their eye and so when they look at a light they see this um <clears throat> multicolored <clears throat> excuse me they see a like a multicolored flower floating in the sky right in front of them and what the buddha sort of asks when he presents this example to the bhikshus to the students the the the, the line of inquiry is about where is that flower is it floating in the air in front of this person? And what the Buddha responds is, well, it can't be that it's floating in the air in front of the guy because somebody else who doesn't have a cataract, who doesn't have a scratch on their eye, they don't see a flower. So it's not really floating in the air in front of this person. It appears that way, but it's a product in a sense of the cataract. <clears throat> and so then, of course, the line of inquiry that the Buddha then leads the students through, it's about how if it's not in the air, then is it in the light or is the flower in the person's eye? And the idea is, is that when the person with the cataract or the blemish, when they turn away from the light, they don't see the flower. It's only when they turn to the lamp that this flower emerges. So the flower can't be in the eye because when I turn away, it's not there. So it must be in the light, right? It's the last place. <laughs> it's the, the last place it could be. And once again, the person without the cataract looks at the same light and doesn't see the flower. So where's the flower? Well, this teaching of the, the flower, the floating flower because of the cataract, this teaching is about dependent origination. It's about pratitya samudpata, dependent co-origination. And the reason why it is about dependent co-origination is because the idea is, is that this flower, it co-originates based upon the defective eye and the light. So in other words, it needs both the light and the defective eye to come together for there to emerge this flower. Now, as a product of this dependent origination, there's something that we can learn. And what it is, is what about the flower that appears to be floating in the air in front of this person? Well, an aspect of dependent co-origination is that then we can understand that the very nature, the very essential nature of this flower is that it is empty. In fact, it has no essential nature. It's not an object. It's not a thing. You cannot grab it. You cannot hold it. You can't sell it at, you know, at the open flower market. It's not that kind of flower. Even though it appears to be a flower, it doesn't have any substantial nature. It is truly a mirage in this sense. 
So that's where we begin was, is with this idea of the flower. And I wanted, and I have been emphasizing that the idea is, is that this person has a blemish, a flaw, a scratch or a cataract on their eye. And so in that sense, you can think of the eye as a, well, as what it is, is a kind of sensor, right? That it senses these things. And the idea is, is that if your sensor is flawed, the, the end product is going to have a flaw representative of that. And so we're really interested in that, that flaw or that cataract or that scratch as really being such an essential component of this codependent origination, right? So now that's our first example, just to let, get, us, get us, you know, a feeling here. Now let's go to my next example. And the next example, and even the one after that, you may have seen before. I, I use many of these examples. And so if you've seen this one before, stay open-minded because there's new, I always add things new to this. So now let's move from our cataract flower to a different idea. So the different idea we have here is this one. And so what I wanna talk about is this. And the idea here is, is that you may, if you're looking at the screen, you may be seeing the letter A. You know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You may be seeing the letter A. And the thing about that is, is that I've used this example in the past to describe a certain difference. And what that is, is it's sort of about the difference between the world of meaning and significance, if you will, which is that this is like a letter that has a sound. It even has a meaning because the single letter A means like, you know, a Dharma class. So the it's a word, it's a word, it's a letter, it has a sound. But here's the thing about all of that the sound of it, the meaning of it, all of that. If you've never learned English, if you've never been taught English, if you come from some totally other country, maybe you come from an Asian country where they use characters, ideograms instead of phonetic characters, then you wouldn't be seeing the letter A. The idea is, is that if you don't know about the letter A, then this is just um, a shape, a form, right? And what's interesting about it as a shape or a form is that if you can really separate out the letter and actually just see the form, a shape, light and dark, then what I would ask you is, how many? Three black lines, two black lines, one weird black line? Because again, it's not a letter, it's a shape. And so is it three shapes? Is it one shape, two shapes? Like the nature of the form, well, it has its own thing going on. Like if we're just viewing it as a shape, what, what the Buddhists would call rupa, just the form of it. But as soon as it's a letter, that's something else altogether, right? And here's the thing about it. So now I wanna to tie together our two examples. This is so subtle, but I'm, I hope you can understand this. You can begin to understand your, your education, your knowledge, the fact that you know about the letter A and you've been taught that and you've been taught the little song, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. The idea here is, is if you are seeing that, then really this kind of looks like that. Meaning 
it's a it's part of a meaning matrix and you somehow carry all those other letters and number or letters in your mind b c d e f g and in that sense the letter a is 1 26th of a meaning matrix that you are very, very well familiar with. And so what I want you to kind of see and begin to notice as this pertains to our cataract is that you can start to notice or think of all that knowledge of yours as like a blemish on your mind, by which I mean you're seeing something, but there is emerging something in the in-between called the letter A. And it's like that floating flower. You think it's out here, but it ain't out here. Because remember, if there's somebody who doesn't know about the alphabet and doesn't know about the letter A, when they look at this, they don't see the letter A. Just like that person that doesn't have a cataract doesn't see the flowers. So now we begin to notice that the, the letter the letters in your mind in that sense, it's not out here. <laughs> so once again, if you understand that, that the knowledge, the actual understanding of the alphabet can be seen as like a weird blemish on the mind. It's actually what the Buddhists will call dust. That's the dust that has settled on the mind. And the idea here is, is that you then just think, oh, look, Michael's holding up a card with the letter A on it. Am I though? That's what we want to start to examine. Now, just like those flowers that were floating in front of the guy, when I asked, or when I said, are those real flowers? The idea is they are not real flowers because they are dependently originated. And they abide, in the, in the language of Buddhism, they abide nowhere. They are not in the air, they're not in the eye, they're not in the light. They're a phenomena that's emerging in the in-between of all of that. Just like the letter A in that sense. Okay, so that means that our letter A is empty because it's not out here. It's this idea that emerges in the in-between in that sense, all right? So everybody good with those two examples? Excellent, from those who I can see, perfect. So now we're gonna go to the third example, and this is a new one. Some of my students have seen this one, but it's new to my repertoire. So now we're gonna up it one more time. So. Oh, by the way, just for the just for languages sake, when we're talking about this stuff, we're we're going to be talking about the the um, well, it doesn't really matter. I was just going to mention that in Buddhism, we can use this word Dharma, an idea or a concept in that way, a thing. And this idea is about the emptiness of dharmas. In that way, the flower. In my first example, the flower was the, the specific dharma thing, object, phenomena that we were referring to. And the dharma of the flower, empty. In the second example, the specific thing that we were talking about was that letter A as a dharma, and we talked about it was empty. Here's another dharma. And the thing about this is, is the same exact thing is happening that happened with the letter A. You may think I have something in my hand. And what I want you to begin to notice is that just like that letter A, which was part of a matrix of meaning, a matrix of understanding that implicated B, C, D, E, F, and G, and all the other letters of the alphabet, in order for you to understand and see it as the letter A, you were relying upon all of those other letters. What I want you to sort of begin to notice is that if you know what this is, 
it's also due to your knowledge and your conditioning. And of course, it's a, a great degree due to your anatomy, <laughs> due to the way that you function, that you've, you've seen one of these before, you know what this is for, what it's used for, you know what it's called and all of that. And the fact that you know all of that, there is emerging, my guess is, there is emerging the appearance that I'm holding up a roll of toilet paper. One, one object, one thing, a roll of toilet paper. And what's interesting about what I'm kind of trying to lead us through is that if you really understand what I'm talking about, I don't have a roll of toilet paper in my hand. The only roll of toilet paper is over there with, with you in your conditioned mind. And I know it looks like there's one out here, just like it looked like there was the letter A, just like it looks like there's flowers for that person with a cataract. But if you understand that if somebody, you know, an alien, if an alien showed up that didn't have a behind, didn't defecate, didn't use bathrooms, didn't know anything about our way of processing, they would not see a roll of toilet paper. It's just not here. And I know it looks like it's here. And this is the, the profundity of emptiness. Emptiness is about the roll of toilet paper that you might think is out here. And here's the really tricky part about it is that if you can really kind of grok that, you get that at a deep level and you're like, okay, then just like the letter that as soon as it ceases to have meaning and significance in that way, it just becomes a shape, a form. The same thing is here. It's a, a form, a shape that is eliciting in your cataract mind, right? In your blemished mind, it is eliciting the ideas of toilet paper and all of those things. But again, the idea is to understand that that's all happening over there and that toilet paper is empty. There isn't a roll of toilet paper. Now, if you've gone that far and you're like, okay, it's just a form, then we're at this level where, just like I said, okay, if that's just a form, then is it one, two, or three shapes? Like, how many are we talking about? Similarly, this has the cardboard roll thing in the middle, and then it's got the paper outside. So that's two things. And the roll of toilet paper, which includes both of those, is a dependently originated concept over there in your mind. So we can't really continue talking about this as if it's one thing. Because the only singularity, the only one thing is the toilet paper, and we've dealt with that. So this isn't even one thing at that point. And then it, it, two things. I don't know, like, I would really beg to differ if you said this was just two things, right? Because there's a lot going on here in that sense. Now, the deeper level of all of this, of course, is that if you have abandoned the roll of toilet paper, but you're still left with a piece of cardboard, that too is an idea or a concept, a tube. A tube is a concept, also like a cataract flower, an idea in that way. So now the, the, the cardboard tube, the paper, all of these things are equally as empty. And that's the teaching of, or a lesson on the teaching of emptiness. It's not, it's a really, really subtle teaching that, that's not about existence and non-existence, being and non-being. It's actually more about consciousness and perception and how we're seeing the world and understanding the world in that way. So it's not, I guess, in a fancy way, I would say it's not about ontology, but epistemology, to use some fancy words. 
but I mean, it's about how, how we understand things, not the chemical molecular makeup of objects because molecules are ideas, empty. <laughs> it goes on and on and on and on and on. Okay, I have a few more things to say about this Dharma, that idea, but everybody doing okay with the where we're at? Excellent. Okay, so the idea that I wanted to walk you through is since we're having such a good conversation about emptiness, I always kind of assume that most Dharma doors uh, participants are familiar with the Heart Sutra, the Pranya Paramita Heart Sutra. It's the shortest sutra, so if you haven't, you know, read it, I don't know what you're waiting for, right? It's so small. But so if you're familiar with the, the famous Heart Sutra, there is a part in the sutra that I would like to walk you through really quickly using this specific example. So the line that I'm referring to, the one of the famous lines from the sutra that I'm referring to is it's the line that says that within emptiness, dharmas neither arise nor cease, are neither defiled nor pure, and neither increase nor decrease. That's the line. And it's kind of a complicated line, but it, it directly pertains to our sutra tonight, to the ideas that we're talking about right now. So I want to walk you through those, those three sets of ideas using our friend here. So the first one says that within emptiness, within this dimension that we're talking about of dependently originated phenomena, within that dimension, all dharmas, all phenomena, no matter how small, how big, I don't care if we're talking about the planet Jupiter, uh, a little ball of lint, an idea, a concept, a feeling, like it doesn't matter. Any dharma within emptiness doesn't arise or cease. And what that is specifically referring to is the idea, so let's say you think, let's say you're still under the impression that I have a roll of toilet paper in my hand. If you're under the impression that I have a roll of toilet paper in my hand, then your understanding of that object is that it was created and that there was a day, there was a time before this existed. And somewhere, who knows where the factory where the plant is, but wherever the toilet paper factory is, we have a sense then that there was a day that this didn't exist, and then it rolled off the assembly line, and it existed. And I went to the, to the grocery store and I bought it because it exists. In other words, it had arisen. It had come into existence. Then the idea is, is that there will be a time when this is gone. I, it's, it's gone. That's later on down the road, either due to me using it or just due to natural decay, impermanence, whatever. The idea is it would come to be nothing. And so it had arisen, it currently is, and then it will cease. Now, the Heart Sutra, the wisdom, the prania, the wisdom says that all dharmas neither arise nor cease. And of course, that should be actually very clear to you now because you know I don't have a roll of toilet paper in my hands. And so the idea is, is that if you understand that there's no toilet paper out here, what what could have come into existence then? Not the roll of toilet paper. That's an idea in your conditioned mind. <laughs> so what we thought was a roll of toilet paper is actually just a concept and that doesn't come into or out of existence. It's either a concept being had, like you might be having it right now at this moment, and therefore 
it be, it be an impression you be under, it, it be happening in that sense. But it's an impression, it's like a mirage. And so just like, just like the mirage of a lake doesn't come into existence as a lake, it comes into existence as a mirage. But that goes back to our cataract flower and all of that. So the role of toilet paper, quote unquote, doesn't arise or cease. Let's deal with that second one really quickly. So the second set of ideas is that all dharmas are also neither defiled nor pure. Now that's a particularly interesting one concerning this thing. So let's pretend like you still are under the impression that I have a roll of toilet paper in my hand. And let's say that you're still under the impression that it came into existence, is currently being, and will someday go out of existence. If you're in that mindset, then you might have the problem that Malcolm X pointed out, which is the conditioned um, impression that things that are white are pure. That's a, Malcolm X made a famous critique about ideas about just the color whiteness being associated with purity and the innate racism kind of built into that, the problem of it. And so isn't it interesting that we, you have white toilet paper, right? Because we have that association of purity with white, whether, we, you know, it's again, it's a deep conditioned idea in that sense. Now imagine I stepped away for a second and came back and there was a brown, yeah, right? It, it makes you, it makes you ew, right away, right? Impure, defiled. Now, if you have been following me this whole time about the non, the, about the emptiness, of the roll of toilet paper, that the toilet, the toilet paper has neither come into existence nor goes out of existence, not even a thing like that. Regarding that mirage of a roll of toilet paper, was it pure and now it's impure? How could that be if there's no roll of toilet paper in that sense? So first of all, there's no roll of toilet paper to be pure or impure. But then, even if there were that object, why is it that when it's white, it's pure? And then when it's brown, it's, it's, it's defiled. Maybe because of the associations you have in your mind that go back to that original misperception of it as a roll of toilet paper to begin with. So follow what I'm saying here, like kind of notice that it's like, oh, because I think it's a roll of toilet paper, I have ideas about its purity and impurity and the color, the specific colors that would make it pure and impure to the point where if I offered this to you as it is, you'd be like, thanks, I needed that. But if it were had the little brown stain, you would be like, uh, no, thanks. Im it's impure. It's dirty. And then the same idea, not regarding the toilet paper, but regarding the, the whiteness and the brownness, we start to begin to realize, oh, those are ideas and concepts too, equally empty. The very ideas of pure and impure, empty as well. You will never find purity in the world and you will never find impurity in the world in that sense. In that sense, in, in sense of emptiness. Okay, so neither increases nor decreases, or sorry, that's the one we're working on next, but neither arises nor ceases, meaning it doesn't come into and out of existence. Pure, impure? Nope, not within emptiness. And then the third one of those is about, and all dharmas within emptiness, neither increase nor decrease. Now there's a few different ways to understand that idea. I'm just going to point out one. So 
we're back to this. And let's say you still <laughs> think I have a roll of toilet paper in my hand. And you think it came into existence, is currently being, and will someday go out of existence. And you think it's in a state of purity because it hasn't been used yet and is white in that sense. The idea here is, is that if you think that, then you may think that my roll of toilet paper just got one sheet less. It just decreased. It, in other words, if I did that again, it decreased again. And you're thinking about this as an object that has come into existence and is currently being and is currently pure because it hasn't been used yet. That same mentality is now thinking that the toilet, the roll of toilet paper is decreasing, heading towards its demise, one sheet at a time. And the idea is, is that it's going to keep decreasing one sheet at a time until that last sheet. And then we arrive at the end of the toilet paper. It has been exhausted. It's done. It's, it's now out of existence because we used it all up. So those are those three sets of things from the Heart Sutra regarding our roll of toilet paper. It's coming into and out of existence, purity and impurity, and then increase and decrease. Similarly, when we were at the factory and this was being made, it was increasing, right? It was getting bigger and bigger and bigger until it had existed. The idea here is, of course, is that that's not happening because there's no roll of toilet paper to decrease in that way. Just like there was no roll of toilet paper to be defiled or pure in that way. Just like there's no roll of toilet paper coming into and out of existence in that way. The Heart Sutra, of course, and this sutra that we're about to get back to is not about rolls of toilet paper. The Heart Sutra and the sutra we're talking about, it's about our, our sense of self and the sense of others as well, those that we think are like us, humanoid or sentient beings in that sense. And so what the Heart Sutra is, all, is really kind of talking about is not about toilet paper coming into and out of existence, but about you and your sense of having been born and currently existing, and then the idea that you will go out of existence. So the Dharma of Michael, the Dharma called you, the idea is, is you think you came in, that there was a day before you existed, then you had your first, your born day, you were born, and now you exist because of that, but this is all headed towards you going out of existence. You may also have the idea that you've done good things in your life, meritorious, good, beneficial action. You might have an idea that you've done bad, naughty things also. But if the you that we're talking about is empty and has neither come into existence nor goes out of existence, then what has done good things and bad things? What is good or bad at that, at, at, within emptiness? So you, within the realm of emptiness, this idea of you doesn't come into and out of existence, actually. And within the realm of emptiness is neither defiled nor pure. And be very clear about what that means when we say neither defiled nor pure. Remember, it's both of those. <laughs> so... It's not everybody is immaculately perfect, nor is everybody fatally flawed. It's actually thinking in terms of duality, like purity and impurity. Yeah, that's the problem. That's delusional. That's, those ideas are all empty in this sense. So self coming into and out of existence, but within emptiness, not. The self being good or bad sinful or whatever, with an emptiness, neither good nor bad, neither defiled nor pure. And then the third one of these, as it pertains to you and me in that sense of ourselves, is the idea of us getting older 
by which I mean, when we were younger, we increased, we gained in body mass, we gained in intelligence, we gained, we got bigger, we increased. But as we get older, we start to decrease and things start to fall apart and we decrease just like that roll of toilet paper until that last sheet of our life is spent and we are now no more. So that's sort of a way of thinking about increasing and decreasing as it pertains to you. And what I'm kind of, of course, want to do now is tie all three or however many examples I gave, tie them all together by really bringing us back to the sutra. So the real teaching here that actually it took me this long to get us up to this speed so that we could get to the, to the real talk. That was really all pre preliminary because what we're really talking about is not rolls of toilet papers or letters or anything like that. We are talking about the self in that way. And so what I kind of want to now tie together is how it could be that you could look down at your legs and your feet, or you could look in a mirror at your face. And in a similar way, like a giant cataract on the mind, there emerges you, like your sense of self as existing and being and having been born and fated to die and all of those ideas, Maybe those, or not maybe, that's what the Dharma is suggesting, is that like that cataract flower that emerges, like that letter A that emerges, like that roll of toilet paper that emerges in the in-between, our very sense of ourself is a dependently originated emergent phenomena in that way. And what we're now about to get into is one aspect of that self which is the very perceiving I, all right? And of course, I wanna remind you as I did last week and as the sutra does, but the sutra doesn't do it, it doesn't do it again. So I'm gonna do it again. We're only talking about the eyeball tonight, but we, everything that we are about to say goes equally for the ears, the nose, the tongue, mouth, body, and brain, cognitive mind all six sensory organs, which is the totality of your functioning sense of self in that way. We're going to talk about the eye, but it goes for all of them. So where we left off, and I'm going to just review quickly, it was part of these back and forths about the sutra. And so if someone is confused, unable to understand the past and future of the I. That person is a fool caught in Mara's lasso, and that person will not like this sutra. If someone is ever penetrating prati videha, this idea of like seeing through, throughout in a penetrating vision. If someone has penetrating vision without confusion regarding the past and future of the eye, they will be liberated from all of Mara's lassos, and this person will love this sutra. So I read that one last time, as well as if someone is confused, unable to understand the being and or non-being, the being and non-being of the eye, that person is caught in Mara's lasso, and that person will not like this sutra. But if someone is, has ever penetrating vision without confusion about the being and non-being of the eye, they are liberated from all of Mara's lassos, and this person will love this sutra. If someone is confused about the appearance of the eye's decay, or format, formation and decay. They are ignorant, caught in Mara's lasso, and this person will not like this sutra. 
But if someone is, has ever penetrating vision without confusion about the appearance of the formation and destruction of the eye, they are liberated from all of Mara's lassos. And this person will love this sutra. Okay. So those are ones that we read last time. And then it went on to say, if someone is confused, unable to understand the exhaustion of the eye, they fall to the level of ordinary common practices and this person will not like this sutra. If someone has ever penetrating vision without confusion, about the exhaustion of the eye, they transcend ordinary common practices, and this person will love this sutra. I'm gonna skip one just because I wanna, I read it last week and I wanna get to some, the new part. So within this same vein, it says, if someone is confused, unable to understand the tranquil extinction of the eye, they fall to the level of ordinary common practices, and this person will not like this sutra. If someone has ever penetrating vision without confusion about the tranquil extinction of the eye, they transcend ordinary common practices, and this person will love this sutra. And I'll do the next one, then I want to pause for a second. So the next one is, if someone is confused, unable to understand that the eye does not come or go, they fall to the level of ordinary common practices, this, and this person will not like this sutra. If someone has ever penetrating vision without confusion that the eye does not come or go, they transcend ordinary common practices, and this person will love this sutra. Okay, so I want to pause there, and then we'll get back to it. So the sutra mentioned a couple of times about the exhaustion of the eye and the tranquil extinction of the eye. Um, and I just want to kind of address that specific language. So... What's interesting about it is that the specific language that's be, being evoked here is about the language of nirodha. Nirodha means this extinction or this exhaustion. And originally in kind of the early, early form of Buddhism, what we would kind of call Theravada or the Hinayana, it, it's all about nirodha. And it is still all about nirodha, but Originally, the idea was is that Nerodha was the third noble truth. You know, the, the noble truths can all be kind of reduced to a single term, a single word. The first noble truth is the noble truth of suffering, the truth of, that, of suffering, the noble truth of the accumulation of suffering, what mo most people talk about as the cause of suffering, but it's actually about the accumulation of suffering. And then the third one is about the cessation of suffering, the extinction of suffering, nirodha. And then the fourth noble truth, by the way, is the path, the path that leads to the cessation of the accumulation of the suffering. That term nirodha, the cessation, the idea about that idea was that we are, from the early Buddhist point of view, we are ablaze with desire. We are burning with desire. The sensory organs burn with desire. There's a famous early Buddhist sutta called the Fire Sutta, in which the Buddha talks about the eyes are on fire, on fire with desire, wanting to see things. The ears are on fire, wanting to hear things. The nose, the tongue, the body, the brain, they're on fire fire with desire, wanting, craving. And nirodha was the cessation of that craving of the sensory organs. The very, that very craving, the tanha, 
the idea of Nirodha was the cessation of all of that. And the whole practice, all the meditation, all the insight, all of that was about squelching the flame of desire. Now, that, that's the goal. But what's interesting about Mahayana Buddhism, what's very interesting about this teaching of emptiness, is that the language of the sutra, when they say, if someone is confused, right, and doesn't understand the extinction or tranquil extinction of the I, what it's referring to is this idea of that one doesn't understand the nirodha of the I. And the idea here is, is that within this perspective of emptiness that we're talking about tonight, the I is already in a state of peaceful quiescence because of this emptiness. And it's going to be an ignorance about that that stirs this desire up. And so the suffering and the desire and all that is real. It is, it's happening when it's happening in that way. But what the teaching of this is about is that it, it's not the I that is causing it because you thinking you have eyes is what's causing it. And that's a very subtle point there. Now, that's about this language of extinction or exhaustion or tranquil extinction. It's all these references to this idea of nirodha. But then the reason why I wanted to go through the Heart Sutra, the neither arise nor cease, you heard it here. If someone is confused that the I doesn't come or go, that's the same basic language of arise and cease. It's just the language of kind of, uh, well, of coming and going, but it's referring to the same thing. This sutra is suggesting that, well, you won't like this sutra if, if you don't understand that the I doesn't come or go, which is to say, if you think the I arises, comes, is currently in your head seeing things, and then will go out of existence, yeah, you might not like this sutra. So, everybody good with all that? Cool. So now we can really just kind of read a little bit more of the sutra, because now we're, I think, very, very comfortable with what they're talking about. Okay. If someone does not understand that the I has no self and is always confused about the extinguished nature of the I, this person will not like this sutra. If someone is able to understand that the I has no self, and has an ever penetrating vision into the extinguished nature of the eye, they transcend ordinary common practices and this person will love this sutra. If someone does not understand that the eye has no self and is always confused about the practice of kshanti, patience, that person falls to the level of ordinary common practices, and that person will not like the sutra. If someone is able to understand that the eye has no self and has ever penetrating vision into the practice of kshanti, patience, this person will love this sutra. So really quickly about that one. So both of those were about this idea that the I has no self. You can read that two different ways and they are both uh, equally applicable. One way is, <clears throat> and this is actually more of an, uh, a Hinayana, an earlier interpretation of this. So just let that be known. But the earlier Hinayana interpretation of this would be that the sense is, is that you could have eyeballs, 
operating, <laughs> ears, listening, a nose, smelling, a tongue, tasting, a body, feeling, and even in a way a brain, cognizing all of those impressions. And there, all of that could be functioning without a self there. That's the kind of a more of a Hinayana version of it, where this is more of like a kind of a, um, a sensory meat bag robot. <laughs> It's like a sensory meat bag robot that's functioning and is confused that it is a self versus this functioning thing in that way. I wouldn't interpret this that way because that's still going to kind of reify a few ideas that this sutra is clearly not interested in reifying. And so I think the idea of the no self of the I is more about what we've been talking about, which is the kind of empty, it's not there. It doesn't have a, a self. And I know that that sounds tricky in English because the term self is reserved for um, sentient beings. But at least within the kind of more Sanskrit like language, it would be like the way that we use the term an individual, which can refer to an individual object or an individual person. So the individuality of the I, this is talking about it being the individuality of it in that sense. And it had two things to say about that. If someone is able or unable, right, to understand that the I has no self, has no individuality in that sense, and is always confused about the practice of patience, kashanti, right? So that aspect of patience or kashanti, it's very related to the idea of no self in that way. Um, and so this, it's a paramita. It's one of the bodhisattva practices, this practice of kashanti, peacefulness or patience. And the opposite of kashanti is getting worked up, specifically getting angry, but it's also about getting perturbed, getting just getting riled, getting worked up. That's not kashanti. And so the idea here is, is that this is sort of making a relationship between understanding the no self of the I and this kashanti, this peacefulness, versus if you don't understand the no self of the I, we could just put it as if you don't understand the empty nature of the eye, you're likely to get worked up and riled in some way based upon things that you're seeing in a sense. Okay. So there's definitely a lot more to come. So let's get moving. So. Oh, that's why. So now we're going to get into a series where there's a little bit of a language thing. So I'll need to clarify something very quickly. Well, so if someone doesn't understand the extinguished, tranquil nature of the I, they do not accomplish or perfect. The term is Siddhi like the supernormal powers, but the term Siddhi literally means an accomplishment or a, a, let's do accomplishment. So if someone doesn't understand the extinguished nature of the eye, they are unable to accomplish the discipline, the shila, the discipline of non-reliance. If someone is able to understand the extinguished nature of the eye, they perfect, they accomplish the discipline, the shila of non-reliance. The person not perfecting or accomplishing the discipline of non-reliance, yeah, that person won't like this sutra. One who is able to accomplish the discipline of non-reliance 
Yeah, that person will love this sutra. So the discipline of non-reliance, that's a beautiful idea. So I was trying to think of a good way to explain this. And I, rem I remembered, um, which is really funny because you can imagine where I found this and maybe where I was and what I was doing when I first thought of this is a funny example of dependent origination. What's funny is in the same place, there's a copy of a book of Thoreau. I think it's Emerson or Thoreau, one of those transcendentalists. And I think it's Emerson. One of those two, I, I get those two guys confused a lot. But one of those two guys wrote a famous transcendentalist essay, which is called On Self-Reliance, right? And this is about, you know, like, um, was it Thoreau that went to Walden Pond? Was, right? Yeah. So I think it's, it's his essay. Because that idea of self-reliance, you know what? I'm not going to rely on my parents. I'm not going to rely on the state. I'm not going to rely on the government. I'm going to be self-reliant. And so I'm going to go to go to Walden Pond and I'm going to grow my own food and I'm going to build my own house and I'm going to be self-reliant, right? So yeah, that, that's, yeah that's, that's, that's something to do in that way. And the idea here is, is that we're talking about dependency, but it, not in that sense. We're talking about dependency, like the way children are dependent upon their parents. So their children are reliant upon their parents, right? So there's this idea of being dependent upon something, relying on something. And then the transcendentalists, Thoreau, have this idea of being self-reliant. Well, the Buddhists have this idea of being non-reliant. And what that's about is this idea of actually not needing anything, not depending on anything, being completely independent. Independent, not dependent, not reliant upon anything anything or anybody. That is what is in this text being called the shila or the discipline of non-reliance. And it is a path, it's a step on the path of the bodhisattva, which is this moment of not needing anything. Yeah, Tanya. But not needing anything in relation to how you feel, right? Or you feel or it, no. or, or, or your happiness or your suffering. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. This does even extend to food and sustenance to a certain degree, but I don't want to make this sound like it's about asceticism because it's not. It's much more about what Tanya just said. It's about a, a emotional independence in that way. That is the teaching of non-reliance. Now, there's an even subtler aspect to this too, by the way, that I do want to mention really quickly, <clears throat> which is it's actually about at its kind of most exalted point, it's not even forget food. It's about not even relying on the Dharma, not even relying on Buddhism in that sense. And this is a very uh, Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra sentiment, but it's this idea that these teachings, this Dharma, these sutras, these classes, these ideas, they're all stepping stones towards independence. And there's actually a point where our reliance upon the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, and all the teachings, even that is transcended to the point where it's not relying on anything. And again, I would just kind of really want to emphasize that word independent, not dependent in that sense. So furthermore, 
if someone does not understand the extinguished nature of the eye, they do not accomplish the discipline of anasrava, no outflows. If someone is able to understand the extinguished nature of the eye, they accomplish the discipline of no outflows, anasrava. Being able to, or I should say, those not perfecting the discipline of having no outflows, that person will not like this sutra. One able to accomplish the discipline of no outflows, that person will love this sutra. So that's another old term from the Hinayana that I'm pretty sure this sutra is using in a, a slightly different way. So the term is again, anasrava or anasrava, and it literally means no leaking, <laughs> no leaks, which in your, in your average English translations, it's gonna be this term, no outflows. It's about outflow. <clears throat> it's a really kind of interesting idea. I will, I have a little time, so I'll, I'll go into it a little bit. So the early Buddhist teaching, the Hinayana, as it would be called, you may know, especially if you've been studying with me, that the, the, the goal, the terminus, the end point of the Hinayana is being an arhat. That's the, the that's when you're, uh, when your suffering is in Nirodha, when your craving, when your suffering has been extinguished, that's an arhat. Um, certain levels of wisdom are the arhat. And an arhat has no more outflows. Anasrava. So this term outflow, it has one very specific connotation has one very specific thing it refers to, but then gets expended, expanded to refer to a, a number of things. Regarding this early form of Buddhism, very ascetic, pretty male dominated, outflow literally was basically the emission of semen, which could be in terms of having sexual intercourse, it could be in terms of masturbating, or uh, often spoken about one is what is called the nocturnal nocturnal emission. So the, the wet dream, as it's called in, in a euphemism in English. So emitting semen at night, during a dream, masturbating or having sex. Those are all considered out the outflow. It's the outflow of semen. And so one who has completely cut off all outflows doesn't emit semen anymore, has completely retained all sexual energy. I have seen some literature that in the female discipline, this is about not menstruating. So the ending of the outflow sort of like the way some female athletes sort of sometimes stop menstruating. So I've seen that, but I, I haven't found that in canonical Buddhist literature. I've only seen that in commentario literature. Regardless, literally that word is referring again to the, the leaking, like actually leaking in that sense. But then at a broader way, it's referring to sexual desire, sexual passion, or just passion in general. And so what's an interesting way to think about this is you can kind of think of it as like something that grabs your attention, whether it's visually something on a screen that grabs your attention, or if it's um, a song or auditorily, something grabs your attention, you can kind of see that kind of attention as a type of outflowing, a kind of oozing out. And 
in a really kind of subtle way, you or, or like what I'm thinking of is particularly salivating. And the idea that like you you get something really delicious and all of a sudden you're leaking. <laughs> Your, your passion and your desire has actually manifested as saliva, like pouring down your mouth. Again, you're kind of leaking. There's a number of ways in which bodily fluids and passion start to have a kind of a relationship. So I just wanted to put that out there as like, you know, if you're ever inclined to think of the body as a psychic manifestation so not as a physical thing but as a like like in a dream like the way like a uh, like a virtual avatar like the way you would imagine that you should look so the body and everything as a psychic projection well then what's up with the emission of semen and salivating and all these things if it's a psychic projection you can almost see it kind of literally as outflowing in that way of the passion in physical form regardless in the hinayana they were very clear kind of about what this meant because they were really 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 into preserving sexual energy as are not just as were but as are many meditative traditions many meditative traditions are not just about the retention of sexual energy and, you know, there's traditions that talk about the health benefits of the retention of sexual energy. But from a Buddhist point of view, this is, of course, more about being in control of oneself. Like having control of those passions. And in a way, in the early Buddhist school, the ability to control one's sexual energy, the ability uh, to not masturbate, the ability to not have sexual intercourse and the ability to even control the mind to the point where you don't even dream about it in early buddhism that was considered a virtue to control sexual energy in that way i think things are very different in the mahayana because of everything we've talked about tonight in other words within this kind of perspective of emptiness sexuality is like another just another empty thing it, it doesn't have any more priority over other empty things. It's part of the equanimity or the upeksha of the teaching of emptiness is it really equalizes everything in a beautiful way. So Mahayana Buddhism is not as obsessed with sexuality and sexual energy the way early Buddhism was. So in reading this line, I would suggest that they're referring much more to this sort of more like this outer outpouring of excitement, this outpouring of adulation towards things in that way. And sort of the discipline or the shila of being able to control that in that way. Okay, cool. So we tackled that. Boom, boom, boom. No outflows. We're good. Awesome. We're going to make it through, I think. So another one. If someone is able to understand the extinguished nature of the eye. Uh, they, they do this thing where they perfect the wisdom of no outflows. So not the discipline of no outflows, but the wisdom of no outflows able to perfect the wisdom of no outflows, a person like that will love this sutra. That second one, not just about the discipline of not outflow, but the wisdom of now, no outflow. I more or less talked about it, but the basic idea is, is that one aspect of it is the actual physical discipline and control of those passions. And the other is about the wisdom of controlling those passions. And I would suggest that the second one about the wisdom has to do with this teaching of emptiness I've been going off about. <laughs> and then if someone does not understand the extinguished nature of the eye and is always confused about the empty 
nature of the eye, unable to give rise, they will be unable to give rise to the knowledge of Dharanis, mnemonics. <clears throat> and that person will not like this sutra. But if someone is able to understand the extinguished nature of the eye, is not confused or is ever penetrating about the empty nature of the eye, this person will be able to give rise to the knowledge of mnemonics or Dharanis, and they will love this sutra. If someone understands the extinguished nature of the eye, perfects or accomplishes the knowledge of mnemonics, Dharanis, as well as the anuttara, the unsurpassable, unattached knowledge, this person will love this sutra. Uh, let's, let me talk about Dharani's really, really quickly. So this one mentioned someone not understanding the extinguished nature of the eye. And then we finally hear it, by the way, even though I've been talking about it for several nights now, we finally hear it. And if you, if someone is confused about the empty nature of the eye, that's what I've been talking about all night. Then if you don't get that, if you don't get the empty nature of the eye, then you're not going to be able to generate these Dharanis. <clears throat> and I've talked about Dharanis in the past, but they're an interesting aspect of Mahayana Buddhism. And from everything I've gathered, they're a type of mnemonic device. They are these little... <clears throat> They might be a word, they might be an anagram, right? Where the letters of the word stand for things. It might be a sentence, but the idea is there are these variety of mnemonics that are called Dharanis. And the idea is, is that they are memory aids. They help you retain knowledge. And ultimately they help, they help you remember all the Dharma. They help you remember all the sutras. And so if somebody is confused about the empty nature of the eye, they're never going to discover or bring forth or find these Dharani mnemonics. But if someone does understand the empty nature of the eye, they will give rise to these Dharani mnemonics and they'll love this sutra. Then it says, if someone understands the empty nature of the eye, perfects the Dharani mnemonics as well as the supreme unattached knowledge. So the knowledge of being completely unattached, not clinging to anything. That person will love this sutra. Then it goes on to say, if somebody doesn't like this sutra, and they're always confused about the extinguished nature of the eye, they regress and eventually lose their dhyanic concentration, their meditative concentration, and the realization of the unsurpassable knowledge of truth will become difficult. If somebody loves this sutra and they're able to penetrate the empty nature of the eye, they accomplish all the meditative or dhyanic concentrations and they realize the unsurpassable knowledge of the truth without much difficulty. If somebody understands the empty nature of the eye, and they are able to penetrate the characteristic of selflessness, they will always hear sutras like this, deeply generating great liberating faith and attaining the state of non-obstruction. 
if someone contemplates the extinguished nature of the eye day and night without neglect, they will accomplish Dharani mnemonics and achieve eloquence, always being able to broadly explain this sutra. If someone contemplates this sutra, perfecting the knowledge of the manifestation of lights, all the Tathagatas will be revealed to them by being able to penetrate the empty nature of the eye. Erecting hundreds of thousands of stupas and offering each one to all of the Buddhas. If someone contemplates this sutra, the merit they obtain would surpass all of that. Someone summoning hundreds of thousands of pleasures and offering all the benefits of it all to the Tathagatas. But if somebody gets to hear this sutra, the merit obtained would surpass that. All sentient beings seen by the eye of the Buddha, all together making offerings to the Tathagatas for immeasurable hundreds of thousands of kalpas, it would be nothing like receiving and retaining this sutra. If someone accepts, retains, and expounds, even just four lines of verse from this sutra, this person would be revered as a superior, greatly compassionate guide. In the past, for hundreds of thousands of kalpas, I roamed throughout the three realms of samsara, making offerings to immeasurable Buddhas for the sake of this sutra. Also, with immeasurable hundreds of thousands of lamps, with wicks a mile long, I gave them all in order to attain mastery of this sutra. Al and also with Parajita flowers, Sumana flowers, Ashoka flowers, all made into flowery wreaths, flowery banners, flowery canopies, all such things as this given as offerings to stupas of the Tathagatas in the past within samsara coming and going fulfilling the wishes of all beings by being able to give, giving flowers and fruits, trees and parks, bridges and springs, white elephants and giraffes, giving jeweled horses, giving golden couches with curtains of pearls and jewels, also giving necklaces of floral wreaths. Like this, every one of them, totaling hundreds of thousands, all given just for the sake of this sutra. Okay, that concludes the first part of this sutra. <laughs> so in the last few minutes here, I just wanna tell you about something. So as you all know, I normally read from the Big Yellow Book, A Treasury of Mahayana Sutras. And this sutra that we've been reading tonight and for the last five nights, six nights, um, is in here. But as I have said many times, a lot of it is left out, lots and lots. In fact, tonight, the thing that I read tonight, I would say half of what I read they leave out, they just leave out completely. And it's a little unfortunate because you don't get quite the repetitions. But then this sutra, the first part of it ends where I just stopped. And then there's a part two that goes on for a good while, actually quite a while, yeah, number of pages. There's some beautiful, beautiful parts of section two that I plan to read next week. 
So we will read chapter two or sections of part two. But what I want you to know is, is that as usual for our Dharma Doors class, I am translating from the original Chinese version that this is translated from. And imagine my surprise when not only are there large chunks of part one and two of this that are left out, when I got the Chinese version, I realized this thing has five sections and they only translated the first two. So I'm not going to attempt to translate the missing sections before next week. So I am just going to de deal with section two um, and basically kind of then put this sutra on pause for a while. Um, by the way, um, on that note, next week will be the last Dharma Doors for a couple of weeks. I'm going to be taking two weeks off, which might be news to a Tanya, um, but I need to take the next two Sundays after that off. Um, but then I'll be back in January uh, with a brand new sutra, brand new Dharma doors in that way. So, uh, but once again, next week, we will finish off with some beautiful, beautiful passages from part two of this sutra. That's it for me. <laughs>